tunnel and his contents exactly as he had found them, and he'd return at a later date. But first, he cleverly concealed the entrance of the tunnel, and he marked it on his map exactly where it was on the mountain. So, answer to your, your question, Tom, he told the group that after the six weeks of uh, meetings, that they would leave on June 19th at 1 p.m. to go to Mount Shasta to, uh, to dig out these treasures, and that there were three caves in total, and in two of the other caves, he, for the people that would come with him to help catalog the items, he would then make available what were in those two other caves for them. So these people sold, sold their possessions. They all were on the bandwagon to go up to, uh, to Mount Shasta with him. Eighty people waited that morning uh, on June 19, 1934 for, for uh, J.C. Brown at the designated time. Uh, he didn't show up. People waited all day. They waited all night. Finally, the following day, they called the Stockton police, and they did an investigation. But no, no trace of J.C. Brown could be found. He just completely disappeared. The 80 people who waited in vain for him told the police that they believed in the authenticity of his story, and they believed in the, the existence of the vast tunnel in Mount Shasta that was filled with go golden artifacts. So now the police asked, well, how much money did he take from any of you? And the only thing that they could come up with is that while he was in the federal shelter, he had borrowed $5 from, from one of the men. And when they asked him why he was in the federal shelter, he said, well, if people had known I was a millionaire, you know, then they would kidnap me you know, for my money. And I had been kidnapped once before. So here it was. He was telling them, you know, hey, I'm a millionaire. I'm incognito. I'm here I, I, at my expense. I'm going to take everybody up to Mount Shasta to... Uh, to unearth, you know, this this great art, art, archaeological find at my expense, and then he mysteriously uh, disappears. So after reading this, I was, you know, intrigued by what I just read. I said, you know what, I, I wrote down all the clues that I had learned about the legend, and I decided to go to the New York Public Library and spend at least a month to do my own investigation and see if I could solve the 73-year-old mystery surrounding the man known only as J.C. Brown. And you found something pretty interesting about J.C. Brown, didn't you? Oh, yeah. Well, the first question that we all have, and I'm going to lay this out as, you know, like how my mind worked. I says, okay, I've got seven or eight clues. The first question I had to ask Ramon was, was there a man named J.C. Brown? So I did some digging, and the answer was no. I, was, I wasn't able to find anyone in the United States named J.C. Brown. So there, right there, I says, well, maybe this isn't going to go anywhere. So the next question I asked was, did the Lord Cowdery Mining Company exist? Was there, was there a Lord Cowdery Mining Company? So the funny thing is I went on Google when I'm at the library there, and I Googled it, and lo and behold, there was a Lord Cowdery Mining Company of England. So now I, I got my first break there. So my second question I asked uh, Ramon was, was the company named after the owner himself? Was there a Lord Cowdery, you know? And the answer was yes. So now I had to go and try to figure out, okay, well, there was a Lord Cowdery. Who is this man? You know, is this the same man who shows up in 1934? I don't know. I know uh, they said the man was in his 60s when he showed up. He said he re retired. But the man said he had worked for the Lord Cowdery. Lord Cowdery Mining Company all of his life and, and waited till after he retired before he came up to Shasta to, uh, to seek the fortune. So the first question was I had to rule out Lord Cowdery or, you know, make him definitely the guy who uh, was J.C. Brown. But what I learned was uh, Lord Cowdery was born Wheatman Dickinson Pearson. And he was born in uh, July, of, of, uh, July 15th of 1856 in uh, Woodhouse, Yorkshire, England. Now, the interesting thing about Pearson, his family, his family uh, was uh, started. The, the company started out as an engineering company, and uh, so he was an engineer, just like the man in the legend. But he was an oil industrialist, and he was the owner of this Pearson conglomerate. And so here it is. I have a man who, uh, very prominent man. He was <clears throat> into globalization. He built the Dover Harbor, docks in Halifax, railroads and harbors all around the world. He even built the Sonar Dam in Sudan. But in 1889, 
Porfirio Diaz invited him to Mexico to build a railroad from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Now, while they were laying track there, his crew discovered one of the world's largest oil fields, the Porterio del Llano. And this was interesting because here he is now in 1890 in Mexico. And I says, okay, I don't have him in the United States, but I've, I've got the owner of the company in Mexico in 1890, you know, building a, uh, a transcontinental railroad. And, and the, the, the interesting thing about this was this was 12 years before the Panama Canal. So the Lloyd Cowdery Mining Company got the rights to build a railroad that went from the Gulf Coast of Mexico to the Pacific side. The railroad was 210 miles long, and goods were able to go from the United States to the Far East, to Japan, to wherever, and back and forth, and beat the Americans to the punch before they built the, the, uh, the, their, their Panama Canal there. So this was a major thing. But how my guy became so rich was that when they were building this uh, railroad that was going on both sides of the uh, Gulf and the Pacific, they struck oil. And uh, thereby they ended up creating the Mexican Eagle Petroleum oil, oil Company, one of the largest firms. But today it's known as Royal Dutch Shell. So the Shell mm. gas stations today go back to Lord Cowdery, the Lord Cowdery Mining Company, because their first big find was out of Mexico in uh, 1919. But here is the clue that got this all, the linchpin that got this all together. In 1917, I find out, Sir Wheatman Pearson became officially known as the first Viscount Cowdrey. So that's how he got his name in 1917. And this was the most important clue that I would need to put all the puzzle pieces into place. Because now I made the connection that Sir Wheatman Pearson was also Lord Cowdrey. Mm. Wow. So he, hmm. So he would keep himself um, incognito. So. Well, well, no, no. That's what I first thought. But now, the the next question was because that was my first question. I was right where you were. But then I go, wait a minute. Now I have to place him in 1934 at the office of the editor of the Stockton Record in 1934. So now what I had to do was get a biography to find out, okay, I know he was born in 1856. What, when did he die? Well, I found out that he died in May of 1927, seven years earlier. So now I had to turn my attention to someone else, and then I, I reread the legend all over, guys. I said, okay, I got to read this all over. I got a headache there. I go, you know what? I'm going to figure this out, but it's not the owner of the company. So when I reread the legend, it's, it, it just jumped off the page. I worked my whole life under the employ of the Lord Cowdrey Mining Company. So here it is, a faithful lieutenant that I'm looking for. So now I go to the different library in, in New York and uh, the commercial library there, and I get a biography on the life of Sir Lord Cowdrey. Once I got it, I learned in the book that uh, there were three other men that helped him build his empire. There were photos of, of Lord Cowdery and the three other men. I then, one by one, started looking to the backgrounds of the three other men. It was then that I learned that just as the man had claimed he had spent many years in the employ of the Lord Cowdery Mining Company of England, I was able to use that information I found in that book to link one of the four men, who was J John Benjamin Body, being the man who appeared in the office of the editor of the Stockton Record newspaper in 1934, claiming to be J.C. Brown. So would have, would have uh, Body had enough money to pay for all of this? Did well, he make he, enough money working with um? Well, yes, because what happened was when he was building, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that's why I set it up when he was building the railroad there in Mexico under Porfirio Diaz to, to build uh, the trans and Railroad, when they struck oil, being he was the, the senior guy on that job site, he became very rich, very, very rich. Lord Cowdrey made him a multimillionaire after that oil find in Mexico. So, that, so those 20 years, he became a multimillionaire. So by the time he shows up in 1934, he claimed to be already worth $40 million. Lord Cowdrey, his boss, when he died in 1927... He was worth over $300 million, and it was, was claimed to be the richest, the sixth richest man in the world in 1927. Wow. 
So here it is, you know, once I ruled out the owner of the company and I found out it was one of his lieutenants, the next thing was I had to ask myself, well, he, he didn't live in the United States. He wasn't born in the United States. He's worked in Mexico all his life. How did he find the time or what brought him to Mount Shasta or the area to search if he was domiciled, working and living in Mexico? And I put, put it up to my higher self. I said, you know, what do you think? The next day I was guided to, uh, to go back to the library. And uh, I, I decided, well, you know what? Let me look at border crossings through the United States, Mexico, or Canada and see if I can find Sir Lord Cowdray or his real name, Sir Wheatman Pearson and J.B. Body or anybody else that I found in that biography, in that book, coming in through Mexico or through other ports of entry in the United States around 1904, 1907, you know, similar dates that were claimed in the legend. And then, so, interestingly enough, when I, when I went and I looked at the border crossings, bullseye, I was able to find Sir Wheatman Pearson coming over the border in 1903 with uh, J.B. Body, W.E. Sayers, and Robert Adams. So just as in the legend that J.C. Brown claimed that he had gone up there in 1904 in March, here it is, I have a border crossing, not only with him, but with his boss, and two other engineers. Then I looked further into border crossings. In uh, 1907, J.D. Body comes back, and now he brings in three other civil engineers with him named C.M. Yeomans, John McLaughlin, Fred Kleisner, and he also brings in a fourth man, John Gilmartin, who was his personal valet. Guys, nobody brings in a personal valet w with him unless they're a millionaire. So here it is. Yeah. I knew I had, yeah. I had the guy. Now, this is... This now I'm sitting there and I'm looking. I says I got it. I started looking at more border crossing guys, and now I look at 1910. And this is what was funny. And this this is when I realized I was really onto something. J. B. Body lies on the manifest and says that he had never been in the United States before. Now here it is. I'm looking at 1904, 1907. Now I'm looking at 1910, and he's claiming to the U. S. Customs officer that he's never been in the United States. Now why would he do that? Mm -hmm. Mm. Mm. So have, did you come up with anything that places them in the Shasta area? Well, just what I'm sharing now, because the Mount Shasta Resort closed down in the 30s, and uh, so uh, if, the, if the resort had still been open, I'd be able to probably see some sort of registrar or some sort of sign-in book to place them there. So no, I didn't have anything as far as that would go, because there's no records of a building that's you know, been de demolished. All right, here, here's my question. Is there any border entries that you can find from any of those men in 19, what was that, 1934? Well, 1934 is when he shows up in Stockton Record and claims that 30 years earlier he had yeah. found these things up in Shasta. Exactly. I'm wondering if he left in a hurry because someone was beating him to it. Maybe one of the other four men? Well, interesting enough, the other, the other men, I checked all border crossings for these guys, and yeah. they, never came, they never came back through the border, the engineers that he brought with him, because those guys worked for the Lord Cowdery Mining Company. They were loyal. I mean, C.M. Yeomans was someone who came in from Australia to work uh, specifically in Mexico. John McLaughlin was another, another guy who uh, was from Utah. Fred Kleisner was somebody out of Austria. So the people he brought in there on the second time with him, the engineers, were brought in under the, the, uh, the instructions of Lord Cowdray uh, himself, uh, the owner of the company. So this was something that initially was, was done between the owner and uh, J.B. Body together to orchestrate this, or bring my guys up there and see what you guys come up with. So, I mean, this...